Christmas memories, I've had a lot of them. A Christmas that changed my life came when I was 20 years old. I was in the Air Force in Germany. I was lonesome, homesick, and I had no idea what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. But one day I walked four miles through the snow to a little pawn shop where there was a guitar in the window with a $5 price tag. And although I didn't know it then, my life started to change. Ah yes, that time of the year. A time where good old Johnny here certainly wasn't the only one who ever experienced a lonely Christmas. Every year that goes by I try to make a Christmas or at least a New Year's episode because I tend to look back a lot and like many people around the world try to make sense of what happened on this latest round around the sun. I probably often tend to overthink it because I know that with an audience this size you will find many different perspectives on the meaning of Christmas. Some of you will love it, others will hate it and there is no way I can satisfy all of you. That is why I want to dedicate this episode to a specific group of people, those who often find themselves unhappy at this time of the year. Whether it's stress induced by social obligations or businesses running in overdrive because of the holiday season, conflicts and families or just loneliness. First of all let me tell you a few things about my own experience. I've been in a relationship for a few years now and we always visit my and my girlfriend's families and have a pretty good time there. Nobody seems to stress out about the perfect Christmas and there are typically no conflicts to speak of. But that wasn't always the case. In fact, when I was a child, I dreaded Christmas because my parents, and especially my dad, were totally fed up with the obscene consumerism that had overtaken Christmas. For me, films like Jingle All the Way represent everything he didn't want to be, I guess. Finding it. You got the doll, right? Is this father's nightmare? I'll get that toy. I promise. The doofus dad who has to make little Billy happy at all costs, even when that means to stress out completely while everything that might actually be meaningful about this time of the year is lost. My parents decided to no longer partake in what they rightfully criticized, but they kind of went overboard with it and we often had zero decorations and no relatives or friends visiting and the mood was generally rather depressing. Christmas, for all intents and purposes, was non-existent in our house. Years later, as a university student, I would sometimes not even come home on Christmas at all and spend my days and nights in my dorm room in an otherwise almost completely empty building because, well, almost everyone had left, of course. It was in those years, though, that I learned that there were others who did also not go home because they either had no family or came from a broken home or their families lived in different countries and the list goes on. I know that there are millions of people like that out there. The reason you might never hear about them is because you literally don't see them because they are alone by themselves inside and will probably not talk about it too much because it's really nothing they are proud of. But I actually want all of you to have a good time here. And that is why I want to show you how I made peace with Christmas. And that is by allowing myself to do something I rarely do play with and work on some toys and special items that remind me of my childhood or things that I always wanted to have. And like Johnny with his first guitar, to be more thoughtful and sentimental than we often allow ourselves as adults and somehow channel this into something creative. Last year around Christmas time I visited this wonderful model railway display that isn't too far away from my old hometown. In fact my hometown is actually depicted here as well since it's rather famous for its viaduct. I've actually shown it at one time in a video I made a few years ago. This model railway system here actually shows a part of the region in Germany where I grew up on a summer day in the 1970s to be more specific. And there are lots of wonderful details and easter eggs wherever you look here. Visiting a place like this is a great idea for this time of the year. And on a personal level this really took me back to my childhood when 
My brother and me had a model railway system at home in our room. We played with it all the time. I actually spent a lot of money on additional train cars and model house kits and even built little model buildings from wood and whatever I could find. Later a lot of it fell into disrepair and I think I also had to sell some of it in my early 20s when I really needed money. It was really sad but that's how it often goes I guess. But there actually might be a second chance for me here. From around 2020 to 2022 I helped my girlfriend to take care of the house she grew up in. Her dad had passed away and there was a lot of stuff to either throw away, sell or keep. One of the few things we decided to keep is a collection of toys and models and things he must have bought for himself but maybe never found the time to enjoy. Like this Fuller brand model train station that I'm building here. It's been the first time since the mid 90s that I have attempted anything like this. This model apparently came out in 1981 and there is a good chance that it was sold around the time that I built one of these houses the last time, some 25 years ago. I rarely take the time to build something tiny like this that serves no purpose than to look at it. But just maybe this is another great thing to do at this time of the year. Maybe you still have one of those kits lying somewhere and it has been waiting to be built for decades as well. But actually there is more where this came from. A lot more. So let's explore what I found inside this box here that we found in the attic of that house. Fans of model trains will already recognize the Märklin logo on this original box here. They never threw anything away in that family, which is not always a good thing, but in this case some real treasure was preserved here. This old manual seems to give an overview and detailed information over different types and systems of Märklin track components. But in addition to all those rather technical details, there are some amazing pictures of entire railway systems that seem to depict typical scenes of German cities in the decades after World War II. An amazing find. This little brochure that is much newer, but probably still decades old, shows some engines and wagons and prices in Deutsche Mark. Probably a lot cheaper than what you have to pay today, I would guess. And here a catalog for Märklin locomotives from 1966 in pretty much pristine condition. Brothers Märklin Göppingen in Württemberg. It even came with an unused coupon with a stamp of the toy store that it came from. And this was just a few kilometers from where that old house is located. This basically proves that my girlfriend's dad got this when he was a boy and kept this for his entire life. The catalog starts with showing some models of typical German steam engines, some of which were still being used at that time. Here on the right is a class 44, one real example of which is actually on display as a landmark or monument in my hometown. On the next page we find class 01, which we actually have here in this cardboard box and we'll have a look at that in just a minute. Every page is beautifully designed. The catalog lists various locomotives from various European countries. Among them, some of my favorites from when I still had a model train as a child. And I'm sure many of the viewers from the US will appreciate this. It even has some American engines. And on the last pages we also find some other toys that McLean used to make. I'm sure these model cars would be collectibles by now as well. So let's open the box and take out the steam engine. It actually looks pretty good. However, in order to test it we need to lay some tracks. That shouldn't be a problem since we have more than enough of those. But unfortunately the old transformer here needs to be repaired first. So this old power cord is completely falling apart. It's a good question why this particular cable's insulation is falling apart in such a catastrophic manner while others from that exact time period are still fine. The Macklin transformer works in a similar way to a Variac. But with one important difference. 
Unlike a variac, these transformers actually have a secondary winding that is electrically isolated from the primary. A variac usually only has one winding and doesn't provide electric isolation. In this device, however, the wiper contact on the top slides over one side of the secondary. On that side, the insulation is removed, of course, or otherwise the wiper couldn't make contact. Under the transformer, you can also see an old-fashioned thermo switch that will cut the primary from the grid when you short circuit the transformer. A simple safety mechanism. The old cable is actually connected to it. So this is where I install a new power cord then. And while I'm at it, I'm also cleaning the top of the secondary where the wiper connects to the turns. Merklin model trains run on AC. The voltage here goes from around 9 volts to 16 volts and back to 9 if you go all the way to the right. By pushing the dial, you get a higher voltage here, 28 volts AC. The purpose of that is to generate a pulse that will make the model train reverse direction. So let's try it then. I laid down some track and these are still the old tracks that are almost completely made from metal. Which is a good thing since I remember the plastic ones I had as a kid in the 90s were getting brittle and fell apart a few years later. And the old engine comes back to life. And in another box I also found a bunch of train cars and also another locomotive from the same era. Class E44 was an electric locomotive that was introduced in the early 1930s and actually was in use for decades. In fact, in East Germany some of these locomotives were still in operation until 1991. But when you compare the E44 to the train station that I just built you can see that they have different scales. Why is that? Well, the reason for that is that the same man who had owned this HO scale system, you know, 1 to 87, since the 1960s also bought a Z scale system from Merklin much later. I guess in the early 90s and I have that here as well, of course. There is a starter set with a steam engine, but we also found this German Trans Europe Express with additional train cars and these look almost unused. It took a minute or two to really get the little trains going after all this time, but now everything seems to run just fine. I hope I will live in a house at some point in the future where I will have enough space for a permanent installation. But for the time being I'm super satisfied with this. I must say that it really felt great to get back in touch with this little hobby that I had as a child. And I recommend you do the same thing from time to time, whatever that hobby might have been. This is a model of the German research vessel FS Poseidon, or Poseidon, as we would actually pronounce that here. Commissioned in the 1970s, it served on over 500 research missions, and it certainly must have been a very popular ship among model builders here in this country. This particular one must have been built some 30 years ago, and whoever built it never got finished. It was built with a tremendous amount of love to detail, and the model maker also went into a regular feature frenzy with the amount of fun and actuators that were included here. It belongs to my girlfriend and she has been given it by someone a few years ago and it's been sitting on my shelf for a few years at this point as well. We always wanted to see it on the water for at least once but I never really touched it because I know that I just don't have the time to really finish it in this phase of my life. Not only was it never completed, it also has a lot of mechanical damage in many spots. Also the electronics are incomplete and partially ripped apart and the 30 something euro transmitter is also missing. In other words, I never dared to feature it in one of my reparathons because it always seemed like a basket case. But this episode is about having some fun and maybe also overcoming perfectionism for once. So I decided to repair some of the mechanical damage and also figure out what the ship's remote control features actually are. And most importantly, we want to see her on the water on her own power for at least one time. So I decided to glue this little crane here back together and also made some pieces of brass to repair this hinge here. 
and many other small parts around the ship were also fixed. The next thing that I always wondered about was what all the wires leading into the hull were actually connecting to. So I removed the old ripped apart 35 megahertz receiver and relay boards and probed the wires individually. And here's what I found. The ship has of course a propeller and a rudder, but for additional maneuverability it also has a pump jet. It requires a motor to pump water and a servo to direct or deflect the water jet. The big crane here can be rotated and that still works. But you can also see that the gears are not perfectly aligned and the motor is struggling a little bit. Its boom, which is connected to a pulley system, can also be lowered. And there is another motor connected to the winch as well. This boom or crane in the back here, German name Heckgalgen, which means stern gallows, also has its own gear motor. Since Poseidon was a research vessel, this was probably used to lower submersibles into the sea. The winch is also powered. So all this principally works and could be operated with a modern RC receiver without any bigger problems. But what is actually much more important is that the basic systems like propeller and rudder work. Unfortunately, the servo that connects to the rudder is broken. It is glued to the hull, but I can't really work on it because I can't reach it. If you try to power it, it just doesn't move. At first I thought that this might be a complete deal breaker, but the next morning I had an idea. I made this stainless steel rod that will grab around the broken servo's arm and then it will connect to a much more powerful servo that I install here in the front of the ship, which will then move the rudder. I did this and waited for two days for the adhesive to dry. And I also connected a modern 2.4 GHz receiver. So some of the mechanical issues were fixed. We had mapped out the electric system. I had installed new electronics and we had power and steering. So it was time for the moment of truth. This is a sailor, his home the ship, the greatest movable object men can build. Adrift, but salvageable. The ship is currently back in the shop where it's drying. The electronics amazingly also still work. What became clear from this test is that the vessel is not very well balanced and somewhat unstable in the water. It still deserves to be completed one day, but that is probably more of a retirement project. I'm currently working on a number of much bigger things that simply don't leave me much time for anything else. I'm currently upgrading the water wheel I built in my last video and we will do more tests in January. I'm also exploring a completely different way of generating more power off grid. More about that soon. Now you might see this differently, but in my opinion it is better to do something than nothing at all. And often in life we don't even try because we know that we will not be able to get a perfect result. When this model ship capsized it really felt like a failure, but looking at the footage I now can see how much fun I had with this test that I had postponed for at least three years. And I'm sure this made many of you laugh out loud as well, so I would say it has paid off already. My message here is actually a simple one and I want to go back to what I was talking about in the beginning of the video. If you find yourself unhappy in this cold and dark time of the year, maybe give it a chance and allow yourself to be a little silly and sentimental and do something you liked doing a long time ago. If you feel lonely, be kind to yourself and try to cut yourself some slack. In that sense, I wish you all a Merry Christmas. 
And if you want to support me in my endeavors, as always, you can make a donation. A link for that is under the video. Or you can become a supporter on Patreon under patreon.com slash tpai. See you soon.